BitSwap is the hottest new way to trade tokens. Crawling all the top decentralized exchanges, BitSwap will get you the very best price and value for your trades. BitSwap is changing the game. Try it now at BitSwapDex.com. Welcome to Rice TVX. On today's episode of the Rice Crypto Show, I am joined by Michael Kong. He is the CEO and CIO of the Phantom Foundation. I invited him on to learn more about him and the Phantom blockchain. And at the end of the interview, we discussed the recent news regarding Andre Cronier. Before we get into it, visit RiceTVX.com and sign up for my mailing list so you never miss an update or new Rice TVX content. You will also find my various social media links and more. You can also find Rice TVX on Odyssey and Library, where I have a full catalog of my videos, post up extra content, and share other appearances. And you can also find Rice TVX on BitChute. To support Rice TVX directly, you can contribute or send tips to PayPal, to Cash App, or cryptocurrencies via my Cointree link in the video description. Everything is appreciated. Another way to support what I do is by joining my Patreon channel, where you will get early access to some of my videos, exclusive content, and more. Get your free half ounce of silver, take full advantage of my partnership with Money Metals Exchange in five easy steps. 1. Visit MoneyMetals.com 2. Be a first time buyer 3. Purchase a minimum of $100 4. Use the promo code RICE 5. Get a free half ounce of silver and it's an additional way to support the channel. I will include links in the video description for everything I just mentioned as well as everything shared on today's video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, joining me on today's episode of the Rice Crypto Show is Michael Kong. He is the CEO and CIO of the Phantom Foundation. Michael, welcome to Rice TVX. How are you doing today? Hey, man, I'm going well, thanks. Yeah, thanks again uh, for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to the conversation, uh, and I want to appreciate Isaiah Jackson for connecting us. I was originally supposed to meet with you in Miami at the North American Bitcoin conference, but due to some scheduling on my end, we weren't able to connect and we were able to connect. Now we booked this uh, about a week and a half ago and there's the timing is actually really impeccable considering everything that's going on. And for anybody who's watching today's video, we will be talking about the situation regarding uh, Anton Nell and Andre Cronier um, and the DeFi situation with that and all the rumors. We're going to dispel that. But before we do that, Michael, do you mind kind of giving people who might be unfamiliar with you a little bit of a background as to who you are? So, um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Kong, CEO of Phantom, um, Phantom Foundation specifically. And my background is that I was originally um, from Sydney, Australia. That's where I grew up and uh, studied at university. I um, studied finance and IT and actually spent a couple of years uh, doing research on uh, the EVM. So, um, uh, building software to identify patterns in EVM instructions, um, many to uh, uh, identify, uh, building tools to identify uh, bugs in smart contracts. So this was like quite technical work that I did with a group of researchers back in 20, 2016, 2017. And, you know, um, we're actually still working with some of those researchers uh, to this very day um, on, on improving uh, the middleware. And so around the time when I was studying at university, I also um, started working in the in industry. So my first kind of um, job um, in crypto was working as a as a first um, software engineer for a de software development company in Australia that's quite big now uh, called Blockade. And they're quite famous for uh, the ones that worked on synthetic network token back when it was known as Haven in 2017. So I was a little bit involved in the early days of SNX. Uh, just, just, just a little bit though. Um, and then later on, I started one of Australia's first cryptocurrency hedge funds with a few people from finance. And we were also advising on some cryptocurrency projects. And one of them was this project called Phantom in Korea, which is how I got involved. So initially we helped them with the ICO, you know, the legal aspects of it, uh, the, um, the, the, the token sale of smart contract, 
um, and just giving them advice and that sort of thing. And then um, later I got a lot more involved um, because they needed a lot of help. And so I started to get a lot more involved, more so on the management side, building up a team. And Andre played actually a big role in helping out build that initial team as well of developers and researchers to actually implement um, you know, the asynchronous technology that we have today, where we have a platform now that's running with um, a lot of you know, developers, with you know, millions of, of wallets, with over 200 million transactions processed to the same, with about you know, 800, 900, you know, 1,000 to a million transactions on a daily basis. So it's come a long way since you know, 2018, 2019. It has. It has definitely. And for anybody who's curious about what EVM is, that's the Ethereum virtual machine. And a lot of these smart contract based uh, platforms are integrating the EVM because of Ethereum and the standard that they've kind of set. So just to kind of clarify that for anybody who's watching this and maybe really confused, because I do have like uh, people from a very beginning level of crypto to people that are definitely a little bit more advanced with knowledge. So I got to always try to remember that when I'm doing interviews and trying to cover some of the little simpler aspects. But I appreciate you explaining, you know, who you, who you are. Do you mind uh, kind of going a little bit into when and how you ultimately got involved in crypto? Yeah. So I actually first heard about Bitcoin back in about uh, 2012. And that's because I'm, I was a big fanboy of um, uh, this guy that's a bit notorious in crypto now uh, uh, called Peter Schiff. Because even back then, you know, he was talking about Bitcoin a lot. And obviously he was, um, you know, very, very skeptical of it. He still is this very day. Um, but to be fair to him, you know, he would get people with the contrary opinions, um, you know, onto his show. So I remember he, for example, would, uh, got like Olaf Kalsen Wee on the show, who now runs our uh, Polychain Capital back when he was at Coinbase. And he would debate with them, you know, the merits of uh, uh, blockchain, of cryptocurrencies, of Bitcoin. And so that's when I first heard of it. And because I was following Peter a lot, I was a bit skeptical about it. But then in 2013, People uh, local around me were telling me, you know, all the philosophy and the and the and the history and the benefits of having you know decentralized money, which is like Bitcoin, you know, um, as opposed to you know government um, issued fiat currencies. And I think a lot of my like libertarian beliefs sort of like convinced me as well uh, to get involved um, uh, more so. So I started like you know buying a bit of Bitcoin, but I didn't really want to get uh, too involved in the technical side of things because I wasn't that much interested in working in the payment space as what I saw Bitcoin as back then. But then, you know, come around 2015, 2016, uh, there was a friend of mine um, at uh, university who started telling me about Ethereum and he was a big fan of it. He is a big fan of Ethereum. <laughs> and he was telling me about smart contracts. He was telling me about, you know, all the um, sort of like uh, uh, benefits of smart contracts, talking about, you know, some things that were DeFi related, uh, you know, being able to do all this stuff peer to peer that you couldn't do before. And that really, really got my interest because then I, I could see blockchain technology wasn't just for payments, right? Or the store of value. It was also like a generalized um, engine that could be used for so many different applications like we see today. So that's when I started to get a lot more involved. And that was about the same time that um, I had to do like a final software year project in the thesis. And it just so happened that the professor that, I'm, I'm very good friends with Professor Bernard Schultz, um, who works at programming languages, was very much interested in blockchain research and still is to this day, um, more specifically on how smart contracts are executed, um, because that has to do with a lot of technology that he's very familiar with, which is like virtual machines, um, you know, programming languages, that sort of thing. So I was also able to do a lot of academic research at the university while also getting credit to my degree. So. It was it was honestly like a great opportunity, and I I really enjoyed that time as well. No, it sounds like it, man. Um, whenever you can, you know, be able to get involved with something that's really honestly something that you're interested in, uh, that you see a lot of value in a lot of different ways, and then being able to incorporate that into your schooling. Because I remember going to school for business administration and having to do different projects and when you're assigned a project and you're assigned something versus being able to choose, um, it definitely makes a big difference. And it, it adds to that passion aspect, which helps you to absorb the information that you're trying to learn. So it's a powerful thing. And I definitely think it's a great opportunity. And I think that it's cool that you shared that. Um, now, kind of going into Phantom, because, you know, Phantom is a, is a layer one cryptocurrency blockchain. Um, it has EVM compatibility. 
there is a lot of similarities as far as it being a smart contract platform. There are a numerous amount of smart contract based platforms, some that try to claim to be Ethereum killers and some that complement Ethereum. Do you mind kind of giving a basic explanation from, from your perspective uh, for somebody who may be somewhat new to crypto as to what Phantom is and what problems it solves? Yeah, sure. So uh, Phantom is basically a like layer one generalized smart contract platform. And so what I mean by that is there's like the Phantom ecosystem and the Phantom Foundation. And the Phantom Foundation is basically an entity like the Ethereum Foundation um, that raised money in the ICO. And its core aim is to build and develop the underlying technology that powers the Phantom ecosystem, as well as generally help grow and support uh, uh, the Phantom ecosystem. So, for example, engaging in like a lot of projects and helping them deploy on the Phantom chain. So the Phantom ecosystem is basically a lot of different developers and users, right? So you kind of think about the use cases for Ethereum. Um, so you think about DeFi, you think about NFTs, you think about all those applications that exist there. They're the same sort of use cases you have on Phantom because it's the same um, like platform in terms of being able to execute these smart contracts, being able to run these applications. The key difference being though, is that it runs on an entirely different consensus engine. So what the developers spent a lot of time working on was um, being able to process transactions asynchronously because if you can process transactions asynchronously, <coughs> um, the, the, the transactions become faster and cheaper and network throughput increases. Why? Because if you kind of think about it, like with an analogy using a train, you know, if you're a synchronous network, say Ethereum or Bitcoin, you know, um, say with Ethereum, you know, trains come or blocks come every 16 seconds. If you're an individual, like a transaction, you have to line up in a single queue and the only number of people can enter into that train to be sent off to be confirmed by the network, right? Whereas mm -hmm. like for Phantom, because it's asynchronous, what that means is that you basically have like a train on demand. So um, as soon as you enter into the train station, you as a transaction plus the surrounding transactions that were arrived at around the same time that you arrived, uh, you automatically get to call a train and automatically go into the train and get sent off to be confirmed by the network. And so there's no like waiting for blocks to be mined. There's no waiting in a queue for transactions to be processed where you might not even be included in the next block. You know, <laughs> as soon as you enter into the network, you can call block to be included into. And so because you can do that, um, you can get a lot more um, throughput and you can get faster and cheaper transactions. So it's a lot more scalable in the end. That being said, the most difficult part of running an asynchronous network is how do you get the ordering of transactions when they just enter in at random times? Because there's no ordering to them when they just enter the network um, to begin with. And so what the team of developers did, and these are a team of developers that have been working on the technology for years. Some of um, and so some of these developers um, have been with us from the beginning. Uh, some have more recently joined, but those that have been here there from the beginning till now are the same developers um, uh, that are working on the on the new developments we've got coming out. And uh, I kind of outlined them a bit on Twitter, and there'll be an article explaining it a lot more in depth. So you know, and, we'll, and we all will the same developers. Yeah. So all Sorry, the same I'm developers. Just... And we got a little delay, sorry, but I, 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 we are definitely, because I know people are interested in that, we are definitely going to be covering um, everything that's been happening just recently regarding the Phantom ecosystem. We're recording this on the 8th of March, and I'm going to be uh, releasing it uh, the following day, tomorrow, so Wednesday the 9th, it should be out. Um, sorry to interrupt, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, no worries. So, um, you know, a lot of those developers that were building, that built the original technology that we have right now that has, you know, 100% uptime and is like fully asynchronous are the same developers that are working on the new developments that are coming out. So there's a lot of exciting improvements being made. There's a lot of work that they've done, which is very impressive. There's still a lot of improvements to be made and a lot of shortcomings, but they're going to be addressed over time, you know, to make the technology more scalable and faster than it currently is, in particular on the middleware side of things. What we mean by that is how smart contracts are executed. So there's a lot of slowness in how smart contracts are executed that applies not just to Phantom, but any like EVM based chain or any chain that uses the same smart contract engine that Ethereum uses. And so we're working on creating our own software that will basically fix a lot of those problems that we've identified in the smart contract engine. So again, this is all about achieving scalability. This is all about achieving uh, lower transaction fees. This is all about 
you know, spinning up the network. So that is something that we're actively working on and the team is, we're, we're expanding the team. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, as far as, uh, is this a proof of work or proof of stake coin? Um, it's a purely proof of stake. Purely proof of stake. Okay. Yeah. I just want to bring that up because of all the, and I don't necessarily agree with it, but all the arguments regarding the consumption of the proof of work model and such with the, you said it's pronounced, and I'm hoping I'm saying it right, Lachesis. Did I say that right? Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, it's, well, it's Lachesis. That, that, that's Lachesis. how I call it anyway. Yeah. Okay, Lachesis, the, the Lachesis protocol. What exactly is is it? <laughs> um, it's basically like a series of um, algorithms on how do you get the ordering of transactions in an asynchronous network. So um, without getting too technical, it basically describes you know, how consensus occurs on the network using proof of stake. And so this is the underlying technology that makes us completely different from say other chains and in particular Ethereum, which is a proof of work based, which is synchronous, which processes transactions one block at a time. We process many blocks at the same time, essentially across the different validators that we have in the network. And so <laughs> that technology is connected, you know, that's like the consensus technology that's currently connected to the Ethereum virtual machine and the middleware stack that, say, Ethereum uses to be able to allow us to execute smart contracts. And on top of that sits a whole bunch of APIs, some of them that we've made custom and others that we've imported from Ethereum, like Web3.js. Um, <laughs> these are basically APIs that allow um, developers who build um, like web-based applications and mobile applications to be able to communicate, say, in JavaScript to the network and be able to submit transactions to the network back and forth and also be able to deploy smart contracts on chain. So the way that you write, compile, and deploy smart contra contracts on Ethereum works pretty much the same way as on Phantom as well. And that was Is deliberate because we wanted to obviously make the ecosystem as easy for developers to build on top of it as possible. And you know, with the EVM technology having already exist, already being in existence, you know, it's not it's not the greatest technology to be honest. There's a lot of performance issues there, which is why we're addressing it over time. Uh, Solidity itself as well, it, it's not a great programming language, you know, but it is a programming language a lot of developers are familiar with. And building a Solidity is getting better over time, it has to be said. And so for pragmatic reasons, we wanted to integrate directly with the EVM. So from the get-go, we will be able to, you know, pitch to Ethereum developers, hey, you know how to build on Ethereum, why not try building on Phantom as well? Because you can build on Phantom, you can take advantage of you know, the, the faster and cheaper consensus, and you can still maintain your application on Ethereum if you want, but just give us a try. And I think that sort of argument is, is, one, is one of the reasons why it helped gr grow Phantom so big, because people could start experimenting with Phantom, they could see that Phantom was real, that it was working, and that just encouraged more developers, more users, you know, this virtual cycle of network growth that has led to Phantom being, you know, a, a very big chain right now. Well said, well said. And the Phantom's ABFT consensus protocol, is that different than the Lachesis or is there a combination between the two? Um, so Lachesis is basically like an ABFT implementation of consensus. So in other words, uh, it, it is itself um, asynchronous, meaning um, you know transactions um, enter the network um, and get processed um, as soon as they enter into the network. And, and event blocks get or, or blocks where transactions are included into get get minted and passed around the validators um, simultaneously, right? And it's also fault tolerant because obviously with all um, blockchains, a very, very important property of them is that they're completely fault tolerant. And what I mean by that is basically if some nodes in the network go down, so, um, you know, say with like a 60 node network, like we have at the moment with validating network, if two nodes go down, if three nodes go down, four nodes go down, the network should still be able to continue um, processing transactions as if nothing happened, right? So in okay. other words, one node or a small subset of nodes should not be able to bring down the network. The only way the network can be brought down as with every other blockchain is literally if every single node in the network gets turned off. Um, so it's a form of redundancy. And that's what also makes the technology difficult um, to implement because not only do you have to get an ordering of transactions that enter into network randomly, but you also have to do it in such a way that it's fast and that it's fault tolerant. Because if it takes a long time to get the final order of transactions and you don't get any performance improvements over a synchronous network, there's no real point in doing it, right? And also it's not fault tolerant. You know, if there's edge cases or ways that um, things that bring the network down, then that's also not great either. 
So, um, you know, you've had to do multiple things in order to, um, uh, in order to get the technology working. Okay. And I'm just looking through like uh, these 80 plus dApps that are already deployed on Phantom. I mean, it's pretty impressive between the DEXs, the cross chain bridges, the lending and borrowing, the yield optimizers, the NFT platform tools and wallets. So there's a lot of information just showing what's being built onto Phantom. And most people in the DeFi element would be you know, familiar with obviously like your curves uh, and things to that effect with the uh, and I'm not sure if I'm reading this correctly, but it says here the Phantom ecosystem is growing with thousands of active daily users. And if you're a dev team, you can apply for the, is it 370 million Phantom incentive program? Is that what that is? Yeah. So in about September um, last year, we announced that we we're going to have a, a Phantom incentive program. And it began, first of all, with DeFi. And so, yeah, at the time it was 370 million on FTM. And, you know, it's over like a long period of time. The whole purpose of it is to help grow and add the fandom ecosystem. So like the bigger, basically your um, decentralized finance project is the more incentives you get. And it has to be used um, specifically to help grow your project on Phantom. Um, we're going to have incentive programs released also for NFTs, like gaming and, um, and like uh, metaverses and NFT platforms. Uh, that are based on like similar ideas and it's all about growing the phantom ecosystem so right now in the phantom ecosystem i think you know the number one use case has been DeFi, and that's because that's how the initial growth for phantom started that's what a lot of people use DeFi. Um, that's what, what a lot of people use phantom for which is why it's one of the highest tvl chains out there but on the flip side on the nft side we, we have some nft growth we have some metaverses and games being deployed on phantom but to be honest, it's not as big as, say, other um, layer ones out there and certainly not on the same size as, say, Ethereum. So we also want to grow, help grow that side of the ecosystem because NFTs is a big use case that, you know, people are looking to use. And it's something that I think will grow organically over time anyway, because I think what's important to note is that the fandom ecosystem, it consists of a lot of community members, right? So a lot of the stuff that's been launched on Phantom is purely for the, from the community. In fact, almost every single application that you see on Phantom right now, whether it's Spooky Swap, Spirit Swap, Scream, and you know, NFT marketplaces, <laughs> you know, they're almost entirely from the community. So this is not like, you know, like uh, myself, this is not the foundation. This is not anyone in particular telling them to build something on Phantom. This is just them coming organically to Phantom, discovering it you know, via the internet, and saying, okay, you know, this is an interesting chain. I want to deploy in it. I want to build stuff on it. So the growth that you see here, you know, we didn't we didn't pay people to deploy on Phantom. We haven't, you know, um, hired people to deploy on Phantom. It's just a community that's done it. So all these applications you see on your screen right now, it's all from the community. It's not to do with the foundation. And I think that's amazing to see that pretty much all of this growth has just been organic. No, and it, it, it actually, you know, because that you mentioned that, it kind of leads into like the the next question, um, which would be, you know, a lot of people have heard the situation, the tweet from Anton Nell regarding him and Andre Cronier, who were, um, you know, a big part of the Phantom team, but obviously they weren't Phantom. Like it wasn't like Andre was Phantom, and he he alone does everything for Phantom, and not having him involved means that there is nothing going to be happening with Phantom, which is quite the opposite. So um, let me go ahead real quick before I get, get you to over. answer. We'll this is the, this, we'll this is the we'll tweet, though, that we're referring yeah. to. Yeah, so if I can address the first thing that you said, you said like Anton and Andre were like a big part of the team. Well, you know, Anton and Andre were not officially part of the team except for Andre being as an advisor. And this is something that I really want to point out very um importantly to the audience right <laughs> because i want to correct you know a lot of misconceptions are out there like one of the big misconceptions that i've seen is that people say that oh andre built phantom technology um he is a core developer he's the one that built it all that's that's not true at all that is simply not true so you can go for example um to our github repository go dash opera that's the code base it's all open source every commit is open source and that's this is the technology that underpins the phantom mainnet. This is what gets everything to run, what gets you know transactions to be confirmed across the different validators, et cetera. And if you look at the commits, you will see that it's from developers who are not Andre, right? These are developers, some of whom have been working with Phantom for the past three to four years. And they are the ones that have built the technology 
And it's honestly like a little bit of, you know, uh, disparaging uh, to them it, it, when, when people say, oh, it's just Andre, he built everything. Andre was not involved in the building of the technology that we have now. Andre played a big role early on, very much so with Phantom, you know, because he helped me, you know, um, build the original, the, the team of developers that we have right now that have built this technology. And we discussed, you know, several ideas as to like how to approach, you know, achieving consensus and processing transactions asynchronously. But that was the extent of his involvement. So he helped us set the foundation, so to speak, you know, of, you know, of the development that took place, but it wasn't him that did the development. And, you know, as you can see on your sc screen there, you scroll, you scroll, you scroll, you will see that this is not Andre Cronier that appears on the commits. These are other developers. Yeah, I haven't seen yeah, the no, name yet. It, yeah, no, no, exactly, for years. And, and, and they're the ones that are 100% committed to Phantom. They are 100% still on the team. And they are, are the ones that are working on the next set of releases that we've got coming up. Like I've kind of described before, SnapSync, which allow you to sync nodes, you know, much faster than you can currently do. Well, on the testnet, you can sit the whole network in under 10 minutes as opposed to like many hours. So, um, you know, that's one misconception. And if I can point out another misconception, I think the tweet that Anton pointed out was a bit unfortunate. It was worded quite poorly, to be honest, because it seemed to imply that, you know, um, Andre and Anton basically controlled 25 projects and that they had the keys and that they were going to go and turn them off and turn them off and turn them off. And then they're all going to be shut down, right? And I right. had some people message me and say, oh my gosh, is Phantom shutting down? And I had to tell people, no, that's not the case at all, which is why I put out my tweet. Phantom put out its tweet as well, because that is simply not true. It's just not true. You know, but, it, has, now, I, but I yeah. mean, even though unfortunately it's not true, the way that it was spun in the media, the way that this, um, and I say crypto yeah. media, uh, and the way that Anton made this tweet sound, uh, it affected phantom i mean there was an effect yeah. in the total value locked up there was an effect on just the, the tvl the the entirety of the price i mean there's been a lot of speculation and that's where i said at the beginning that even though i was supposed to you know talk to you a month and a half ago it's it's so crazy how it worked out that once you scheduled how this took place and this is a you know a scenario of a situation that needs to be dispelled people need to understand the truth of it because Truth has many different perspectives aside from the actual truth from a psychological basis. And if you're just reading this without hearing anything else, without looking at your tweet thread or looking at the phantom tweet thread, you would think yeah. that these two guys are just pulling their projects. April 3rd, there's going to be like 25 dApps just gone and, and yeah. there's going to be no development on phantom and it's over. So I just wanted yeah. to get all of that clarification as much as possible. Yeah, and, and to be fair, I don't, you know, he tried to clarify it a bit later. The problem is, is that, you know, the way that, you know, Twitter works and the way that media works is that, you know, the first thing you say is the thing that they run with, right? You know, pe people look at the first tweet and then they panic. They don't actually look in to say, okay, how much of it is this true? Is this a misunderstanding? You know, this doesn't really make sense because we know that there are developers behind multi-chain, for example, or Yearn Finance, or in, in particular, of course, Phantom, you know, and actually do a bit more research. I think a lot of people would just kind of like see the first tweet and then they panic and then, you know, they like, you know, exit, you know, from, from the ecosystem, they exit from, you know, the other projects that, you know, were also negatively affected by that. So it wasn't just phantom and it's really unfortunate to see. Um, but, you know, all, all, I, all I've tried to do in the past few days is just tell people the truth because the the, the truth is, is, is very different from what, I think some people in the community think because I think some people think that you know, you know, Andre is just this like really, really like badass developer who you know can just like run twenty five projects by himself. Um, him and Anton, you know, and that's of course simply absurd, right? He's not because Superman. No how, you mean he's not? Yeah. He's he's not yeah. Superman. Well, no, because he's a, he's a very very smart developer. He's a very smart guy for sure. But no one, no matter how smart they are you know, can run 25 projects, right? So, you know, just thinking about this logically, it doesn't make sense, right? And then, you know, you, you look, for example, like on the on the commits, like you've shown on GitHub and just all the activity on the ecosystem, that's not Andre who's built those thousands of applications. That's not Andre that's built the underlying core technology. That's not Andre that's working on, you know, um, new improvements that are coming to the network. It's not Andre that's working on you know the middleware developments, right? Where that that's not that's not his specialty. You know his specialty is more on consensus and smart contracts, right? It's it's literally thousands of people, thousands of people in the community 
and a really strong team of developers on our side that the team is expanding that have serious academic and engineering backgrounds specifically related to say virtual machines or programming languages or um for example you know um you know uh, consensus right and you know just as an example you know the professor we're working with who was a supervisor at, at university professor bernard schultz you know he's a he's a full professor that specializes in programming languages and virtual machines you know he's worked on virtual machines that's now being used across like every single android phone in existence right so he worked a lot in verifying that that technology worked, right? So he's been like doing research and development on virtual machines probably since before I was born, right? And I'm like 28 years old. And so these are the people with serious um, backgrounds that are the ones that are specifically building the technology that's underlying Phantom. And so, you know, Andre, and I, I don't mean to take anything away from Andre. Andre has been absolutely fantastic. He's a great advisor. He's a great, he's someone that's, that's been great to, to talk about and, and bounce ideas off of but his involvement is not to the same extent as people make it out to be. And I think this is one reason why he doesn't really want to be public anymore, why he's told people he's out of crypto, because he doesn't want it to be seen as some sort of like godlike figure, right? As like this like Messiah who you know can like solve everybody's problems and you know, something goes wrong with a smart contract or, or somebody loses money. You know, he doesn't want to be blamed for it, right? Because I think a lot of people have been doing that and they've been doing it very, very unfairly. And, you know, it's enormous burden to have on your shoulders, you know, when you have like literally like a million people messaging you and saying like, oh my gosh, like do this, do that, you know, Andre, do something, right? And I can tell, and I can understand why he's kind of sick and tired of that. And I, I think that's why it's important to illustrate that, you know, Phantom is not just Andre and Yearn is not just Andre, you know, you know, Yearn team, you know, um, founder put out a tweet saying, you know, to all those that want to bury Yearn, you know, you realize that Yearn, uh, that Andre hasn't worked on the Yearn code since August 2020. They have a team of like 50 full time people. Right. So it's just a fact, right? And well, so didn't they, didn't they're, not, they're not being terminated. They're, they're Yearn gonna, existed before business. Andre, though, right? Sorry? Yearn existed before Andre's involvement. Yeah. I mean, Andre like definitely helped with the project. But yeah, they have their own team. Yeah. Right. So they, they run independently and they have been. You know, as um, as, uh, as Padang uh, put out, I think I pronounced it correctly. Sorry, uh, you know, since August 2020. So, I, I think you know, Anton's tweet was, you know, to be honest, very very problematic. Um, but also at the same time, I think you know, people in the community need to just you know do a bit more research than just like read one tweet and then sort of panic, right? And kind of think about it logically to themselves. You know, does it really make sense that? You know, Anton and Andre have full control over 25 projects. No, that's that's not a very reasonable assumption to make, right? And then, right. And then you that's can, not, you know, well, that's not very decentralized like, either, though. Yeah. Oh, wait. You know, there's a whole bunch of people behind Phantom and thousands of developers in the community. Oh, there's a whole bunch of, uh, there's a whole bunch of developers in a big community around multi chain, right? Or, oh, you know, the same story with Yearn and all these other projects. And I think, you know, a lot of it comes down to, you know, people just get hyped up about good things, about bad things, without really thinking about, you know, w w what exactly the truth is. No, that's exactly true, man. And I'm glad that you, you know, set the record straight on it. Because, um, you know, if you look at an article like this, where it says that um, Wi-Fi and Phantom Tank after um, Andre Cronier and Anton now claim they're leaving crypto, when if you really kind of do some digging, you know, this is just sensationalism to get news going. Yeah, it's but a headline. I, again, the problem with the media is that, you know, they tend to like, you know, do a bit of clickbaity stuff, right? Yeah, well, why, it's, you know, that's why I said sen views. sensationalism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so that uh, but doesn't really help. The word, if you were to use the word terminating, which, uh, which really shouldn't even be used, it would be their involvement. That would be it. And they're handing over anything that they run to the existing teams that are already out there. So it's not going to um, cause any issues with any of the applications or any of the things that are currently running. You have existing teams that are going to be involved. And, and, if, and, you know, I also, Michael, one of the things that I wanted, and I brought this up to you before we started recording. If you're into a project uh, watching this and you've got a specific reason as to why you support whatever the particular platform is, it shouldn't be because of one individual. 
Um, you know, even someone like Charles Hoskinson with uh, when it comes to Cardano, he's not the only developer that builds on on that platform if he even builds compared to the other developers. So, you know, people just need to take that in consideration and look at the technology, look at the other people involved and not be involved in a project because of one specific person, because, yeah. You never know if that one specific person's heart's really into it. Uh, obviously, Andre had an issue with you know the public backlash and and the whole him being the DeFi god thing. And you know I can understand where you'd want to take a step back and and just kind of exit the public so that you don't have to really deal with that. Yeah, I mean uh, that, that's a very very good point. Yeah, I, I I agree with like you know what you said there. I mean you know, one of the things I've also thought about in the past couple of days is. You know, since Andre has said publicly that he's out of crypto, right? You know, people are now kind of like, I'm noticing the founder community kind of more gravitating towards me. And I've always been around as a CEO and, you know, maybe not as public as before, but kind of doing a lot of work in the background, right? Um, but now I see some comments about, you know, you know, like, like it almost sounds like, you know, like people were like depending on me being like, oh, you know, you're, You'll fix everything. You'll do this. You'll do that for the Phantom ecosystem. And I just want to make an important point to people that, you know, the Phantom Foundation or the Phantom ecosystem, it's not just me, all right? I'm not the one that built this technology. I'm not the one that got these thousands of applications on the platform. You know, I'm not the one that has got all these users onto Phantom, right? It's not me. It's the team of developers we have that built the underlying technology. And it's the community as a whole that have built these applications on Phantom. You know, the Founder Foundation didn't build a thousand applications on the network. It's not even possible, right? You know, I didn't build a thousand applications on Phantom, all right? It's not possible, right? It's a community that has done it. So this is a community-run project. This is something that we've always told people it is open source, it is permissionless, it is for anybody to join and leave the network whenever they like, you know, bridge assets to and from the network, do whatever you want on the network for good or bad, right? Whether it's participating in DeFi, whether it's participating in NFTs, whether it's doing whatever it is, right? And it's just right. a technology that's out there, like the internet, that is just freely available for people to use. And my objective at the foundation is to support that growth of the ecosystem by supporting, first and foremost, the underlying technology development, as well as encouraging people to talk about uh, and deploy on Phantom by simply just talking about the platform that we have at the moment, the people that are involved there, and you know the benefits that I see if you're building a blockchain pro project, that Phantom kind of provides for that. So that's sort of like what my job is. You know, but, you know, I don't know. I'm not the FTM god, all right? There's no FTM god. I'm not this special individual, and nor so is like anyone in, in particular, right? It's, it's a team effort, and it's a community effort, and that's something that's really important to note because I don't want to become seen as this messiah figure for Phantom now or whatever. Well, I appreciate you clarifying that, man, and, and someone definitely, in a sense, needed to kind of step up and try to... Um de-escalate the situation and put the truth out there and clarify these uh these rumors basically because i mean it just it makes it look bad and you know i appreciate you taking the time to explain it and i definitely want to be able to do future shows i just want to kind of keep this one as basic as possible about what phantom is so someone who's unfamiliar would get a better understanding i'm also going to include um everything that we shared on today's video it will be linked in the video description so that if you want to go over the article that I shared or even go through the GitHub and look at the different commitments and all the information available because it's all transparent, you're more than welcome. It will be linked down below. That way you don't have to trust what Michael's saying. You can literally verify it's all available. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the whole purpose of like, you know, blockchain technology or the way that I kind of see it is that, you know, it's supposed to be transparent. It's supposed to be open source. So, you know, all of the underlying code for the Phantom Network is all open source. And I do really appreciate you, you know, um, scrolling visually and you can see, you know, the, the, the people, the GitHub profiles that have committed to it. Because I think, you know, when I talk about it, it's one thing. <clears throat> but then when you visually see it on the actual website itself, you know, the, 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 the facts that are there and the people that are, are the ones that are really responsible for developing the chain, you know, you know, it, it just... It just it just illustrates a lot better than me just simply talking about it with words and speech. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that. And yeah, exactly. You know, people just go check it out. All the coders there, all the commits are there, including the updates that we've got coming with you know SnapSync and and other things. And you know, sometimes people um you know put issues on 
the, the Go Opera repository because they have a question about the technology or they've identified, you know, um, like a like a mistake, for example, in the documentation or all that. So even though um, a lot of the development, of course, happens from the founder foundations, like core development team, <laughs> the community also gives a feedback as well. And so literally like every day or two, if we get a question, you know, as a GitHub issue on Go Opera. So you can see all those questions that the community have posted as well. So it's definitely like a community run effort as well even on the core technology itself. And of course, in the application layer, all those applications you see, they're all pretty much from the community. Very cool, very cool. Well, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of clarify and explain that whole Cronier Nell situation. Cause that, you know, that is pretty interesting. Before we wrap up, do you have anything that you want to add or any final thoughts or anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to spotlight real quick before we wrap up the video? Um, all, all I kind of wanted to say is, you know, people should check out, um, you know, phantom.foundation, you know, it has a lot of resources there, has resources, um, you know, the social media links or more technical resources, the applications that you have on uh, phantom documentation on how you can connect to the phantom um, network as, as a developer or, or simply as a user. And so that's kind of like your, 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 um, your, your, your resource to go to and, you know, Guys, you know, I'm going to be around 100%. The whole team is going to be around 100%. Um, you know, work is continuing as usual. The development work hasn't stopped. It's continuing as it has always been, you know, uh, from, from the beginning of the project. You know, all of our work continues as normal. Um, and what I want to do, like like on the podcast and, and these sorts of opportunities, which I really appreciate, is just, just kind of clarify a lot of misconceptions that are out there. Um and simply tell people the truth. There's a lot of misinformation and hype and stuff going around. And I just want to tell people basically the truth. And people can see it also from themselves as well. By, for example, like going to the GitHub or going to the blockchain or, you know, just by, you know, watching these videos and talking to the community. Well, like I said, man, you don't have to trust. You can verify it's all out there and it's all public information. And I'll help a little bit by including the links in the video description. So bear with me one second. I'm going to wrap up the video. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, again, links will be down below. If this is your first time ever watching any of my videos and you're tuning in because you're a Phantom fan, be sure to check out and explore my channel. I would encourage you to make sure you're subscribed. Hit the notification bell and I will leave you with this. Be blessed. Be the change. Practice change.